Let's bow in a word of prayer together this morning. Father, I thank you for this privileged opportunity to gather together to worship you and to dive into your word together. And I ask that you bless this time, that you give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding according to your holy word, that you would change us to be more and more obedient to your commands, that we would live for your glory and according to your wisdom and not fall into the foolishness of the ways of the lost world, but that we would remain focused on you and your ways and living in according to your holy standards. I ask that you guide this time, that you help me to preach your word faithfully. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning we are going to be in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And after preparing the sermon this week, I looked to see if Charles Spurgeon happened to preach on this passage throughout his ministry. And he preached on James chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, on May 25th of 1884. That particular sermon was entitled, A Warning to Waverers. And Spurgeon, as usual, said some absolutely incredible things throughout the course of that message. When commenting on James chapter 1, verse 6, Spurgeon says this, he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Like a wave of the sea, while well, a wave of the sea is very unrestful. You see, it comes rolling up from a distance. On and on it sweeps and never stops. Out on the broad Atlantic, what a life a wave seems to have. Never still, never for a second in one place. Now up like a mountain, then down again like a great abyss. Such is the life of the undecided man. He does not know where he is, and you do not know where to find him. He is never quiet, never still, never at rest. A man who gives himself up to the devil gets a kind of dead peace within him, his conscience being seared as with a hot iron. He is still. This is quite different from the state of the Christian who gives himself up wholly to his Lord and who therefore enters into a delightful heavenly peace which continually deepens and increases. Christians, as Spurgeon is indicating here, are given peace by God. We follow him and we know the truth because we know him who is the truth. We grow in this, we advance, we mature, and we progress throughout our lives. But those who follow the devil, they have their consciences seared. They live according to the foolish ways of the world. There can be no playing in the middle. Are you going to follow the wisdom of God or the so-called wisdom of the world? That is the question, and that is what Spurgeon drives at throughout his sermon. And that is what we are going to cover in our text this morning. A person is either going to seek truth from God or they are going to buy into the lies of the world and the devil. They are going to practice wisdom or foolishness. But some falsely believe they can have both. They profess to be seeking after God's ways, but they are actually living according to the ways of the world. And as we will see in our passage, such individuals are double-minded, divided, and unstable. Let's read the text, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, and see what God says in his word. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." One part of the context of this passage that we need to keep in mind 
is that all the way through verse 18, we see this backdrop of, de of James dealing with trials, preparing Christians to go through trials and difficulties, and even temptation, which you will see in verses 13 through 15. And so when James here is talking about asking God for wisdom, keep in mind that he is discussing this in the backdrop of going through trials in the life of a Christian, which is why I want you to notice verse 4 of this chapter. It says, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so the goal here is that we would be complete Christians, that we would have a deep understanding of the Word of God and be equipped for every good work, that we would be equipped to go through any and all sorts of trials, to endure trials with faithfulness and to remain steadfast for Christ's sake. Now, I want you to notice the last part of verse 4 specifically. It says that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, read the first part of verse 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So what we see here is that James in verse 4 says that Christians should let steadfastness have its full effect so they will not lack. And then in verse 5, he tells them that if they do lack in wisdom, then they should come to God and ask God for wisdom. They should cry out to him for it. And this tells us something. This tells us that whenever we go through trials, we are going to need wisdom when we go through those difficult situations. Isn't that right? A amen. We're going to need wisdom whenever we go through those trials. We need God's wisdom to go through difficulty. We need his wisdom in those times and not the foolishness of the world. We need to understand that God's wisdom is sufficient for any sort of trial that we will ever face or go through in our lives. Now, certainly, to be clear, we need biblical wisdom at all times, whether it's a time of good and ease and not much difficulty, or it's a time of great difficulty and persecution. We need God's wisdom in both of those circumstances. And I like how Noah Webster in his 1828 dictionary describes wisdom. He says this, the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends and of the best means to accomplish them. That is good. Wisdom is the correct exercise of knowledge and the understanding of how to accomplish, how to best accomplish goals that we need to achieve. And we're also given an interesting depiction of wisdom if you come to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. That passage says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So those who live in accordance with God's wisdom, with the wisdom from above, they demonstrate it by living according to the truth with meekness. They are humble and selfless instead of bitter and selfish. They live according to the wisdom of God and not according to the foolishness of the world. Notice in verse 17 of chapter 3 how wisdom is described. It is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That is what it looks like to live in a wise and skilled manner according to God's word. And so whenever we come back now to James in chapter 1, we see where if we are lacking in wisdom, then we need to get it. And we were reminded of this fact in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. So do you want to be wise? The, the very first step, according to Proverbs, is to get wisdom. And the question is, where are you going to get wisdom? 
Where are you going to seek it out? Whose authority are you going to go to? What is your source for wisdom going to be? Well, look at who James says is the source. Remember, he is writing to prepare Christians for trials in the context. And so whenever you go through a difficult time, you're going to be pressed to find wisdom. And where are you going to find it? James says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So God is our source of wisdom. Where do we find God's wisdom? Well, certainly, in a sense, we see it all around us, don't we? We look at God's creation, and we see the majesty of his handiwork, the majesty of what he has created. We can even get counsel on a specific task from an expert, for example, on how to fix something from our car. And in that sense, we are, in a certain way, gaining wisdom and knowledge. But specifically, we must come to God's word for wisdom. God certainly reveals himself generally in creation. The heavens testify to his handiwork, but you don't find the specific instructions for salvation or how God has called us to live and his commandments by going out and looking at creation. You have to come to the holy scriptures. That is where you will find the perfect special revelation of God to his people as to how they are to live. Now, this is an issue of authority, isn't it? What I mean is that whenever you're going through life, when you go through trials and difficulty, and you need wisdom, you're going to have an authority, a source that you're looking to for it. For many individuals, that authority is the God of their own imagination. Those who follow the religion of Islam, for example, they look to Allah and the Quran for guidance. Those who call themselves atheists look to their own ideas, their own agendas. They look to secular science, which isn't science at all, and they look at that to find the answers that they are searching for. Marxists, socialists, and other individuals look to the government as the ultimate source of wisdom and their authority. Liberal churches, they attempt to take the wisdom of the world and the Bible and mix them together. And in so doing, they don't follow the Bible. They follow the wisdom of the world. They compromise the biblical message for the world's message. And therefore, the world is their authority for wisdom. But we are called to look to the source of wisdom, which is God himself. And John Calvin and R.C. Sproul have accurately stated that all truth is God's truth. So when we look for truth, wisdom, and knowledge, we look to the source, which is God. The infallible, perfect, and special revelation of truth is his holy word. And when we lack wisdom, we as Christians must depend upon the Lord for it. Now, what does this mean practically? As I said earlier, the backdrop of this passage is going through difficult situations. So when you're going through a trial of some kind, what does it mean for you to look to God and his word for wisdom? Well, first of all, you actually have to come to his word and read it and seek to apply it. So whenever a family member, for example, blows up at you and becomes angry and irate, You don't return anger for anger. Instead, you demonstrate the biblical principle of self-control and giving a soft, wise answer. That is applying biblical teaching in a skillful way and exercising wisdom for the glory of God. Whenever you lose your job and you go through a difficult circumstance, you practice wisdom by cutting down on your spending. And hopefully you've practiced wisdom by saving as you're able so that you're prepared for that type of a crisis. And you also exercise wisdom by going out and looking for a job to get a steady income again. When the government persecutes you for being a Christian, you exercise wisdom by standing boldly upon the word of God and not rolling over and giving in to the tyrant because we are to obey God rather than man. And we could come up with more examples. But the point is that we come to God's word and we come to him in prayer and then we seek to go apply what we have learned. The Bible certainly doesn't teach us how to do things such as paint a car or 
fix our washing machine whenever it goes out. But it does tell us everything that we need to know for life and godliness, to live pleasing and glorifying before the Lord. Therefore, we come to God. And as our text in James says, we ask him for wisdom. It is our duty not just to seek out wisdom, but here we are specifically told to actually ask God for it. And that fact means that our prayer life must be marked by seeking God for wisdom. We must petition him and ask him to help us grow in wisdom and knowledge according to his word, to give us deeper and further understanding. Is asking God for wisdom a part of your normal prayer life? Do you pray to God that he would give you wisdom and knowledge as you go throughout life in general and also specifically through trials and difficult situations? Is your regular prayer life marked by asking him for wisdom, asking for his counsel, asking him to give you more understanding of the scriptures? Or do you depend on yourself for these things? The temptation that all of us face at certain points of our lives is to depend on our own wisdom or to depend on some other source of wisdom such as the world. What James is reminding us of in this text is that we are to come to God for wisdom. We are to ask him for it and to petition him for it. He is the source of wisdom and we are to demonstrate our dependence upon him by seeking out his wisdom. Really think about this in your life. Do you seek wisdom from God? Do you spend time in prayer asking him for it and time in his word seeking it out? You should. He is the ultimate source of wisdom. And that is what James is talking about here. And I want you to notice what James says about God in this passage. So whenever we come to God for wisdom as his church, is he going to give it to us? Is he going to give us this wisdom that we are requesting? The text says we are to ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. And so what we are to do is to seek wisdom fully, to ask God for it, and he is generous, and he bestows it upon his people. Listen, this is a picture of the mercy of God giving wisdom with generosity. He doesn't have to give us anything. He didn't have to save us. He didn't have to redeem us. The Father didn't have to send his Son to die for us. The Lord Jesus didn't have to take our place on the cross. The Holy Spirit didn't have to draw us to saving faith in Christ. But he has shown us grace and mercy in giving us all those things. And he shows us grace and mercy by giving his wisdom to us whenever we come to him in faith, asking of it from him. He does it by his sovereign power. He is generous and gives it to his church. And he gives it to those who seek it from him, who are truly his. He gives it to them in abundance. He is generous. Now keep in mind, I'm not talking about material possessions here. Um, God certainly does give material possessions in abundance to many people. But what we're talking about here is wisdom, that he gives that generously. He gives it in abundance. And he is generous and kind, and he gives liberally because that is who God is. And every Christian, whether they are rich or poor, can be given wisdom from the Lord. We are told to ask God for it. That is our responsibility, to seek wisdom from God. And as a result of the new birth, as a result of the salvation that we have been given, we understand that God is the ultimate source of wisdom, that he is the final authority. However, we are also told to have faith. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So we are specifically told here to ask God for wisdom and faith. And not in a doubting spirit. And this doubting is perhaps better translated by the King James Version as wavering. It is referring to a distrust in God. If you skip down to verse 8, you'll see that it mentions a double-minded man. 
And that is someone who supposedly seeks after God, according to their claims at times. But they are, in fact, not trusting in Him, but they are trusting in their own selves and in the ways of the world and some other source other than God for wisdom while claiming to seek it from Him. And so whenever we talk about doubting here in verse 6, we are talking about a divided heart, which has some sort of distrust in God. And we are not to act like that. We are to come to God for wisdom and complete faith and complete trust in his sovereign power to give us wisdom according to his will by his word. We are to be rooted and grounded and solidified in him. He is our source of wisdom, and we can be confident in that. And we rest in God. We seek wisdom from him. We obey him. And then we are like the man who walks according to the counsel of the Lord, mentioned in Psalms chapter 1, verse 3, which says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. We are deeply planted in the ways of the Lord. Our faith is deeply planted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we prosper in the sense of doing what he commands, following his ways, laying up treasures for eternity where we will worship him forever. And we yield fruit for his sake. We do not wither away for we are planted in the eternal streams of Christ himself. Of course, if you are not planted in Christ, then you are not going to be given wisdom from God. Whether you are planted in the shifting sand of the ways of Satan and the world, all who are not covered by the blood of Christ, having come to saving faith in him, are practicing foolishness by rejecting the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Therefore, I tell you that you must repent of your sin and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must come to him for salvation, trusting in him, not trusting in your own self, not trusting in some God of your imagination or in the source of the wisdom of the world, but in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, the one who came and died and who will give you salvation once you come to him in faith and repentance, that you will be saved. All who reject him will be cast into an eternal hell. And the only way to be saved is to come to Christ, to place faith in him, to repent, to turn from sin, to turn to following the Lord Jesus. That is how we are given salvation. That is the message of the gospel. You must come to Christ and be saved. And I want you to notice that the doubting man, the unstable one, is not like the solid righteous man. The solid righteous man is deeply rooted in the ways of God. But James chapter 1 verse 5 says, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Those who seek wisdom from a source other than God are driven around like the waves of the sea. They are tossed to and fro by every wind of worldly doctrine and teaching. They have no firm foundation. These people are trying to play games. They are saying they are committed to God, but they are actually committed to the ways of the world. They are attempting to seek wisdom from the Lord with one breath, while seeking it from the pagan lost world with the other breath and spouting out their wisdom with their breath. What a true statement. What a parable that we see that these verses are about evangelical circles in America. I'm sure it is true of other countries as well, but I live here in America, and so I know most about what goes on in the church in this country. The the modern day so-called church is seeking its wisdom from the pagan gods and rules of modern day society. That is why you see pastors, for example, encouraging church members to march in the streets in the name of supposed racial justice while saying that they can't come to church because it would be too dangerous because they can't social distance in church. And so what are they doing? Well, they're saying you can go out and march with thousands in the street. You don't have to worry about social distancing there. But if you want to come to church, that's dangerous. 
That's appealing to the ways of the world because the world smiles on marching for racial justice, but it frowns on coming to church. They're buying into the lies of the world and trying to play to the ways of society. They're not following the wisdom of God. In our text, they go, it goes even further. Notice verse 7. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. That person who is doubting, who doesn't have faith in Christ, much less in the wisdom of God, they are not going to receive anything. They are not going to receive the wisdom from God. They wouldn't truly desire the wisdom of God anyway. They don't really want it. They want to live according to the foolishness of the world. They love those ways. The message of this text is clear. Don't play games with God. He knows all. He knows those who are double-minded. He sees it clearly. He knows those who are truly seeking after his wisdom. And he knows those who are divided, seeking after the wisdom of the world while playing hypocrisy and saying they are seeking after him. He knows the heart. He knows those who have true faith from those who don't. You cannot put on a fake mask before God. He knows everything. He is in control of everything. There is no fooling God. Take the issue of racism, for example, whenever we're talking about evangelicals who don't live according to the wisdom of God. Racism has become a hot topic in our society in the year of 2020. And I promise you that marching in the streets is not going to solve anything whenever it comes to the issue of racism. And calling the entire institution of the police and all of our systems in our country racist is both foolish and ignorant. Th that is taking the wisdom of the world. Now, I am not saying that racism doesn't exist. It does exist. I've seen it even in my own short lifetime. And it is a sin when someone legitimately discriminates on, against another person on the basis of their skin color. And they need to repent of that sin. But... We see evangelicals adopting Marxist, secular, pagan solutions to the topic of racism. They demonstrate they want to live according to the wisdom of the world and reject the wisdom of God found in his word. It is foolish to say that the police and the government is racist as a whole when you can't even point to one single law that discriminates on the basis of skin color. And when pastors, as we have said, tell their congregants they can go march in thousands, in thousands of people in the streets and adopt secular ideas to protest racism, but they can't come to church to worship the true living God, that is clearly living according to the wisdom of the world. They are doubting God's word. They are not receiving wisdom from him. They don't see God's wisdom as sufficient to deal with these issues. Those who doubt will not receive anything from God. Faith is key. Trust in God's wisdom is key. Seeking after his ways. We must have trust and confidence in our sovereign God and that he really has given us everything we need in his word to be the church that he has called us to be for his glory. And we conclude with verse 8. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And that is the conclusion of the matter. For those who do not come to God for wisdom, with hearts full of faith and trust in him, for those who do not do that, but instead seek after the wisdom of the world, they are double-minded and unstable. And the literal translation of this Greek word for double-minded denotes having one's mind or soul divided between God and the world. This type of a heart is showing a person who is a hypocrite, who says that they trust in God while seeking after the ways of the world. Their flesh is their own master. The result is instability. Whenever you don't have the solid rock to stand on, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and his holy word, that is all you're going to have left is instability. You are going to be left unstable and divided. What is the result when so-called Christians go after Baal? 
What is the result whenever they go after the wisdom of the world? Well, they say they are going after the wisdom of God. They even take a Bible verse to supposedly justify their claims, but it is out of context, of course. It doesn't actually mean what it means in their original passage. And so what is the result when evangelicals go after the wisdom of the world? You end up distorting God's design in every way. You say it is okay for a person to have homosexual inclinations. You say it is okay for a woman to think that she is a man. You say it is okay for the church to adopt Marxist ideas. You say that it is okay for a church to hang up Black Lives Matter banners, even though they are an organization that supports abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, Marxism, and witchcraft. You say it is permissible for women to preach in the pulpit. You say it is fine to distort the biblical roles of men and women as given by God. You say it is fine to not meet in church because of a virus that has killed less than 1% of the population. You believe that political elections are morally neutral, even though one party clearly supports the murder of the unborn. You are divided. You are unstable. You buy into the pagan ways of the world, and you have no firm foundation to stand on. And so ultimately, you cave on every single issue. Because the only way to be stable is to remain solidly grounded in the word of God. That is where we come for wisdom. We go to God's word for wisdom. And that is the only consistent source is God. Modern day evangelicals are a parable which clearly shows the double minded man. They say they are seeking after the wisdom of God while seeking after the wisdom of the world and living according to it. And so let me ask you this, who in your life are you going to serve? Where are you going to seek wisdom from? Are you going to go to God as your source of wisdom? Or are you going to go to the lost pagan world? Back in the Old Testament days, the Israelites tried to ride the fence between two different opinions. They said that they were attempting to worship Baal, while also supposedly attempting to worship the God of Israel. They sought the wisdom of false pagan gods while claiming to seek after the wisdom of God himself, which is an all-too-familiar situation for us since we are living in a day where many who call themselves the church are actually seeking after the wisdom of the world. However, there was a mighty prophet who came onto the scene in the days of the Old Testament, you all know him. His name was Elijah. And Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal to meet him on Mount Carmel, to come and to pray to their idol God to send down fire. And right at the beginning of that encounter, we read this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Elijah plainly tells the people to make up their minds, to quit limping between two different opinions. Stop trying to play the middle. Stop trying to be indecisive. Quit playing games. If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And the people do not answer. And we know the story. The prophets of Baal, they call out to their false god. They call out to the idol that they have designed, and nothing happens because idols don't have any power. And Elijah calls out to the one true God, and he pours down fire because he is the real God. Elijah tells the people, quit limping between two different opinions. And we need to take that lesson to heart today. Are we going to fully commit to serving the Lord and living according to his wisdom? Or are we going to follow the ways of the world? God himself demands that you worship him. 
And to do anything else is idolatry. If you seek the wisdom of the world, then you are evidencing yourself to be double-minded and unstable. Those who follow God, those who are truly his disciples, will seek wisdom from him. There is no limping between two different opinions. There is either full commitment to God or no commitment to God. Come to God. Seek out wisdom from his word. Find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Commit yourself to being obedient to him, to walking in the ways of the wisdom which is from above, to walking in the paths which God has ordained and commanded of his people and his word that are good and righteous and pure and just. That is the point of this passage in James, that as we go through life, as we go through difficult situations, as we face trials of many kinds, we are to seek wisdom from God. We are to have complete trust in our sovereign God that he will give us wisdom according to his will. That is what I urge you to do. Don't run to the ways of the world. Run to God himself. And part of his closing to the sermon in James, which we talked about at the beginning of this message, Charles Spurgeon said this in part of that closing portion of his sermon. He says, in closing, what shall I say to you who are undecided? I pray you, think whether you have not been undecided long enough. Remember that the question you have to decide is by no means a difficult one. Whether you shall serve God or Satan. Whether you shall live with Christ in heaven or lie among the lost in hell forever. These are not questions about which there ought to be any choice. Decide then, foolish waverer. If you are a believer in the scriptures, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of men, decide to follow the teaching of those scriptures and accept the Savior and decide at once. May God help you to decide very speedily. Do not be undecided. Do not persist in sin. Do not go after the wisdom of the world. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives wisdom to his church. And it is our job to come to him and to seek after that wisdom in his word and to pray to him for it and to go out and to apply it in our lives for his glory. I'm going to close this time in a word of prayer and ask for the text to come and to lead the closing hymn. And if you need to talk about anything after the service or if you need prayer, I'll be standing over here and would love to visit with you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to gather together, and I ask that you help us to seek after your wisdom, to seek after your ways, to follow you, to see your paths as righteous and beautiful, to see your word as sufficient, that we would live to make you known and to glorify you, and that we would not buy into the lies of the world. And I ask that if there be anyone, Lord Jesus, that have not come to know you savingly here today, that you would draw them to yourself, that they might find salvation in your name. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.